Lubitz. I'm the BC SOGI Education Lead, and that's a position that's funded by the Ministry of Education, uh, SOGI standing for Sexual Orientation Gender Identity. And we've used that acronym over the last number of years because it applies to everybody, a gay, straight, lesbian, uh, transgender. It accounts for everyone because everyone has a sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and the position works within ARC Foundation. So it's kind of arm's length, but in close partnership with the Ministry of Education as well. We form partnerships with essentially every educational partner group that's there. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the presentation. In terms of how I've arrived in this position, so as uh, Kevin mentioned, I am um, uh, elementary school principal in Delta for 14 years and had been doing some work in Delta on the committee. We had a policy developed, SOGI policy developed in 2012. I sat on a committee uh, that was formed uh, that reflected various stakeholder groups. And then uh, ARC Foundation, uh, which is a philanthropic organization in Vancouver, which typically supports marginalized peoples and lately has been focusing primarily on LGBTQ people. ARC Foundation funded a point two in my district, which I took on as a SOGI coordinator. And from that, we built out a bit of a network within Delta. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But in terms of my involvement, uh, I am gay, and that's getting easier to say, and uh, hopefully for people to hear too. Uh, and I've always um, had this issue professionally that's come up and found myself as administrator often reacting and with the fact that I'm gay, having that little apprehension about um, whether people I th thought I had an agenda or not. Uh, and um, so I think about my, my first experience as a student teacher, within a month I had a student run down the hallway and in my face says, Mr. Crothers, Mr. Crothers, is it okay for a teacher to call a student a fag? I knew at the time that was not appropriate, uh, but as a student teacher, you know, where you're just trying to smile and be the Walmart greeter to everybody. You're not trying to ruffle any feathers. You just want to get a job and do the best you can. Uh, it was a bit awkward. The principal ended up finding out about this that had been disclosed to me, called me into the office, and uh, it became a bit of a comedy show because he started by saying, I understand there's been something inappropriate said from a teacher to a student, and I, um, I need to know if it's Mr. So-and-so. I said, no. And then he said, is it Mrs. So-and-so? I said, no. And at that point, I was wondering how many suspects could there possibly be on this school staff and why am I doing my practicum here? Um, he ended up apologizing for that strategy a little bit later, but he identified eventually who it was and nothing happened beyond that that was tangible for students or for staff. There's no learning that happened at that point. I'm assuming discipline, but I wasn't privy to that. When I became a teacher, <coughs> teaching grade seven, my first assignment, three months, I had three boys who were incredibly tight, uh, three musketeers, always hanging out with each other. Two of them came to me after school one time to talk about the other. They were concerned about him. They were nervous, having a hard time telling me. I said, guys, what's up? What, how can I help you? He said, well, we're nervous about Michael, their third friend who wasn't there. Um, he, We think he might be gay. And in my head, I'm kind of panicking because I'm not out and I don't want them to think my reaction indicates that I might be gay. And before I could say anything, they said, but we don't want him to be in trouble. We just want to know how we can support him, which to me was pretty shocking. That's 23 years ago, 12 year old boys supporting one of their best friends. <clears throat> and at the time, we didn't have a policy in Delta and we didn't have any resources that I was aware of that I could turn to. So aside from saying, hey, guys, that's great that you want to support him. It might be a bit early. I didn't really do anything as a follow-up in the class. As an administrator, and those of you who are administrators, which would be most of you, uh, this is some an issue or a topic that comes across my desk frequently, typically in a reactive way where you've got someone being targeted for teasing, whether they're gay or not, they're being targeted for teasing, or it's their gender expression or their gender identity, and we're reacting sometimes in a disciplinary way, reacting to those situations. Um, I think about uh, one of my schools in Delta <coughs> where we had three students in particular who were challenged by this and for a variety of reasons. And we as a uh, staff decided to bring in some BCTF expertise. We did a presentation and that was very effective. And I highly recommend the BCTF presentations. They're also free. All you need is a BCTF member to request them. Either way, we brought in the presentation, but then it kind of left after that. And as administrator, I think I fell short 
and that I didn't follow up with the teachers to see how this was going to look in the classroom. I didn't engage the parent community. I was a little panicked. Once again, we didn't have a policy and I didn't feel um, like I was on solid ground. Unfortunately, those three students, uh, one of them, uh, all three were on suicide watch heading into high school and one of them did take her life. And uh, I'm sure some of you can reflect on situations in your professional career where you've either had the same outcome or you've been worried about a child taking their life. And that was just a reality for me. And so in terms of me landing in this position, uh, those are some of the drivers. I just feel like in our in, in my career, and this is a, a topic where I've just been reacting and reacting. And fortunately, over the last number of years, particularly in Delta with our policy and our committee, we've been far more proactive. So what I'm going to be doing today is looking at the why and the how, uh, along with parent rights. So I'll be whipping through quite a bit here, and uh, we will be sending out the slides uh, as well at the end. So in terms of the why, I don't want to spend too much time on the victimhood piece, uh, although I just shared that story uh, because it is reality. Um, but if you look at risk factors and indicators, uh, LGBTQ people are at greater risk for suicide, eating disorders, depression, absenteeism. You, it runs the gamut. All the data suggests that, and it becomes compounded when you add on uh, gender identity. So if someone's transgender or ethnicity, uh, socioeconomics, uh, family rejection, all those factors to compound that. Uh, we want to try to be, as I mentioned, proactive versus reactive. Dr. Elizabeth Sawick, who is a professor in the School of Nursing, did some uh, great local research within BC and found that those schools and districts that had tangible SOGI policies and codes of conduct that were being implemented, um, there was a clear evidence that it supported all students. So all students, whether they're gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, benefited. If you can imagine that student who may not be gay or lesbian um, being teased because their gender expression suggests that they might be. Um, it just creates a, a better atmosphere of inclusivity for everyone. When it comes to inclusivity, and there's been a lot of debate um, within certain regions, I guess. I mean, it's been, SOGI123 has been welcomed, but uh, debate about whether we need this standalone um, resource. And I just think about my career, and I'm sure you could reflect on a number of programs that have come through your schools that talk about inclusivity. It's not enough for us to say we want this, we all believe in it. There needs to be some resources to support it. So we've got Choose Your Voice, which is a great resource for those people who are trying to tackle uh, anti-racism uh, program or provide anti-racism program. We have the Rick Hansen School Program, which creates awareness on accessibility and um, just, uh, you know, people with disabilities. We have the Friend to Friend Program in support of, um, you know, fostering awareness for autism and, and, and students. Uh, so SOGI123 just kind of blends in with those. It's a resource to support that notion of inclusivity. We also have a change in the Human Rights Code, which was a couple of summers ago, <coughs> where gender identity was included. And so it really is incumbent upon us to do this work, or else we are discriminating against a, a minority by not having them represented within, with, within the curriculum. Uh, so the curriculum core competencies also connect very well with SOGI123. We've got those three, communicating, think, communication, thinking, personal, and social. If we look at the personal and social, um, you know, this really ties in nicely to not just SOGI123, but all those programs for inclusivity, the ability for or the, the students need to thrive as individuals and understand and care about themselves and others. That's a direct connection to the work we're doing with SOGI123. Uh, just have a quick look at these um, questions here, uh, true or false, and just get a, a sense of uh, where you would fall on each of those questions, and I'll quickly go through it. It's, it's rather purposeful that I, I, I typically present these when I'm working with a group. So I'll just go through these. And um, the first gay MP, Sven Robinson, came out in 1988, actually was an MP beginning in 1979, very popular in Burnaby. The story didn't end so well, if you look into that, but very popular. Uh, and that's, you know, 30 years ago um, that that happened. We have uh, legalized same-sex marriage. That actually was in 2005. So we're looking at almost 13 years ago 
we had uh, same-sex marriage approved, and that was with a conservative government uh, at the helm. We have uh, number three, unfortunately is true, LGBTQ students are four times more likely to attempt suicide. As I mentioned, it gets compounded when you add in some other factors, uh, that intersectionality piece. Uh, a transgender woman played tennis in the WTA from 1979 to 81. That is true. Uh, it was Richard Raskin actually was a semi-pro male player and uh, transitioned to become a Renee Richards. And it became quite the controversy because when Renee was playing, um, she was, I think, 47, six foot three, 195 pounds. And, you know, that's pretty intimidating in terms of a size disparity against most women on the tour at the time. So there was talk about doing DNA testing and so on, <coughs> uh, restricting her eligibility. But she did play for a couple of years and had some success. But it speaks to an issue that is starting to happen a little bit in, in school sports and that is uh, with transitioned students or students who are uh, transitioning. Where do they land? Where do they get to play? And according to the Human Rights Code, they should be able to play wherever they feel comfortable playing. Uh, the fifth fact there is true. 85% of teachers want to engage in SOGI education, but only 37% do. Um, and that, there was a study done by every, the Every Teacher Project uh, out of the University of Manitoba. And they um, also found that 82% of Catholic school teachers uh, supported this work. The village people never came out. Uh, that actually, there's only a couple of the members that were gay. And as, uh, as far as we know, there are no public schools banning SOGI resources, although we've yet to check with all of the independent schools. And I don't know if banning is the right word, but um, there may be um, some curtailing of some of the resources. So if we look at the curriculum, uh, and what SOGI education provides, I think is a great quote, in terms of providing a mirror for some students and families to see themselves and a window for all students to see the diversity that exists. In terms of the how, so that's the why, the how. We have on the SOGIeducation.org website, we have one, two, three, three components. Policy, we provide support for districts with 10 recommended or essential elements in a policy. Um, those can be provided online. We also look at the school-wide initiatives get, that could happen to create and foster inclusive environments. That's SOGI 2. In SOGI 3, we have curriculum and resources, and that's more specific to support in the classroom and trying to weave that in. We have standalone lessons, but also suggestions on how this could be integrated in, into most lessons. Uh, there's also a, a component for Pro-D. So one of the... Um, uh, one of the pieces that we got back last year in terms of feedback was having plug and play presentations for staff. So we've de developed some learning modules that are free to anyone who goes online. Uh, they include videos, PowerPoints, and facilitator notes. We have just recently added a SOGI 123 Q&A page geared mostly towards parents, but also other educators. And we're gonna be uh, building out a little bit more to provide some more parent resources. In terms of the how, so we've got that online resource. We've also built up a network to support this work. So prior to this broadcast, I was talking to Kevin, and we have almost 1,300 volunteers now uh, working within the model. So you have myself in the BC SOGI lead position. Then we have district SOGI leads, and the ministry funded training for district SOGI leads back on October 4th. And that included, at the time, 48 districts. We now have 51 districts. <laughs> so 48 district leads getting together going through some of the learning modules and then doing some regional planning and local planning in the afternoon. The idea is that those district leads go back and train their school leads. So we have a champion, a representative on every staff in these districts who is doing staff meeting presentations, maybe engaging with the Pro-D committee to get um, some Pro-D time and just essentially uh, providing a voice for SOGI related uh, topics on staff. <coughs> We're also providing opportunities for regional meetings. So all the district leads in, say, the Kootenays or the Okanagan or uh, the island uh, are getting together every six weeks, probably every six to eight weeks for uh, some training, some sharing and collaboration. So we have a network to support this work. And essentially, we're just trying to build capacity throughout the system. Uh, 
for many people, I know in Delta a number of years ago, it was the first time we'd ever talked about it in a principal's meeting, even though these students have existed for the longest time. So if we look at uh, another key piece of the how, we have a number of partnerships that we've formed. And uh, beginning primarily with the BCTF for the Ministry of Education, who've been partners almost from the get-go uh, with ARC Foundation, over the last, since last spring, we've built out some of those relationships, uh, the BCP, BPA, and I would like to thank uh, Kevin, Kit, and Richard for their support, uh, particularly over the last year here in terms of communications and providing this opportunity, a webinar, but also some other Pro-D opportunities in the short course and the um, Connecting Leaders Conference as well. So we have built up partnerships and relationships with all of these organizations um, and, and a lot of shared learning happening between them. Um, I'd like you to consider this scenario and then I'll get into parent rights. Uh, parent advises school admin that they do not want their child involved in SOGI inclusive learning. Give that some thought in terms of what you might do and then I'll see if I can apply some of the uh, BC School Act and some of the facts that we can find there. So if we were to apply um, some of the levers that are in place or some of the um, elements of the School Act. If we look at apparent rights within the School Act, the, here are some of the things that would be very familiar to you, those of you who are uh, school-based, <coughs> you know, accessing schooling, school records, appealing suspensions, a variety of different things that are identified in terms of parent rights within the School Act. The one that's most relevant to SOGI 123 is likely the third point, which is consulting with educators on a child's learning. And that's where we've really been advising parents to check in with teachers because there has been some misinformation out there. I think there's the perception that's been forwarded by some that this is going to be like a weekly or daily SOGI lesson, when in reality, it's quite likely going to be a reactive lesson in most cases and moving towards proactive, where at some point, uh, teachers will be engaged in this over the course of a school year. Um, but we've encouraged parents to check in with their classroom teacher, uh, their child's classroom teacher to see what this is gonna look like or check in with their principal um, or staff just to see what it's gonna look like at their school. Uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> options, if they want to opt out, you know, in theory, they can't opt out. The only mechanism in place for opting out is the alternative delivery and that applies only to sex ed or sexual health education. And SOGI isn't sexual health education. However, having said that, I had one student whose mother, mother was adamant uh, last year that um, their child would not sit in on any lesson, would be staying home until the lesson or discussion was complete. So as an administrator, I, I can't physically, you know, restrain him or go and pick him up. Uh, he would have been a great addition to the conversation, and it's a powerful message to send to him from the parent. But, you know, my hands are kind of tied there. Uh, we came up with a bit of a compromise to get him back into class after this lesson had happened. But the proviso was that uh, there is no expectation amongst any of the staff members that if a SOGI related topic comes up impromptu at a current events or whatever discussions that happen, that we excuse their child or any other uh, child. Uh, the curriculum is another way that parents can provide some input, but not approval. We just went through uh, an unprecedented process where we revised the entire curriculum, uh, parents had an opportunity to provide input, but not approval. If you look at parent rights, uh, some of these topics I'm sure will be very familiar to you in terms of phone calls and conversations and emails that you've received, likely on both sides of this. Why are we doing Halloween? We have to continue with Halloween. Uh, Christmas, there's too much Christmas in Christmas. There's not enough Christmas. Uh, I want to hear more about Jesus. And for me, growing up, going through Baptist church, I'm always keen to have, uh, you know, kind of that um, that element within, uh, within the concert. Um, so maybe there's one song, but that never seems to be enough or it's too much for someone else. Um, there's, you know, homework is an issue, social media. Uh, dress code is one that comes up every spring. That's uh, in a few months where you start to have spaghetti straps. And I have parents who've been adamant in support of their child's right to wear spaghetti straps. And then other parents who are appalled that people are wearing spaghetti straps. So, so we have all kinds of issues that put us in opposition with some parents. Uh, but that doesn't prevent us from moving forward and doing what we believe to be the right thing. 
Uh, and SOGI 123 is just one of those uh, topics. In terms of specific uh, parent rights, <coughs> um, you may recall, I think in late 90s, uh, James Chamberlain and then Murray Corrin wanted to use some books uh, that were um, regarding same-sex parents. Um, My Two Dads uh, was one of those books. And James was a teacher in Surrey, applied uh, for approval to the Board of Trustees, who denied as a, a vote of four to two, denied that. And there ended up being a court case that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. This is the, um, the final ruling. And uh, what I've heard from uh, legal experts since is that this would, the language now would be far stronger. But having said that, it's, it's pretty clear that the parental views, um, as important as they are, don't supersede the importance of mirroring the diversity of the community. So uh, we have that in, in, in support. Now, I do have a video that I'd like to share, but I think we might take a moment to, um, to take some questions. And then those of you who'd like to watch the video, it's only three minutes, uh, we'll just play that out. Uh, but maybe we'll take some questions now, Excellent. Kevin, if you have any that you wanted to interject with. Sure, thank you, Matt. Uh, first off, I, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate um, you begin with sort of really personalizing the story. I think many of us who are school leaders have found ourselves in similar situations. Uh, a question for you. Um, we work in an interesting business. Sometimes parents who are uh, emotional don't always set appointments or give us a, a heads up that they wanna talk about these issues. I'm just curious from your perspective in terms of um, if a school leader finds themselves in a position where you know, they, they have a parent who's quite concerned and emotional over this and wanted to discuss it right in the moment, what advice would you give uh, to principals and vice principals to really, um, uh, sorry, uh, calm the situation and, and, and be involved in that productive, courageous conversation? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And one that I worried about as well with parents coming at me and, and uh, you know, up until a few years ago, I don't know how comfortable I would have been having that conversation, particularly if you have a parent and there's lots of data or misinformation they pull out and throw at you and then you're left, you know, how do I respond to this? That sounds very convincing what they're saying. Uh, and what we're trying to do is build capacity within administrators too, and hence the webinar among other things, so that you have some conversation points that you can make, but also talk just generally about the whole notion of inclusivity and how this is one aspect of it. Now, as I step away from the SOGI related question, generally when I have a parent who's upset, um, my fallback is to listen to them and if need be, set up a formal meeting afterwards to follow up uh, 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 and, uh, and sometimes just to help get some of the emotion and just listen to them um, but having that thoughtful conversation afterwards uh, we've all been there where you have someone who's emotional you don't know what's led to that it could be a variety of factors and this is the last item that's just pushing them over the edge listening to them and agreeing to, to meet again to follow up gives you a bit of time them a bit of time uh, but we now fortunately have resources for you to turn to um, you know, speaking points, um, resources, lessons that, that you can turn to. And so can the parents and direct them to some of these, um, the, the Q&A page on SOGI123. There's resources you can turn them to as well. Great. Thank you for that. So uh, you may get to this, but I'm going to ask the question anyways. Um, so, you know, more and more, of course, uh, principals and vice principals have to be very familiar with uh, the School Act and court cases and law. And so um, I, I'm just kind of curious, well, what's your understanding in terms of when can a student um, agree to participate in sort of a, a SOG club at school, at, but can do so without parent uh, knowledge, parent involvement? I'm, I'm just kind of very curious about where that line might be. We actually, this question has come up a number of times in the fall, and it's actually quite an issue in Alberta. They just passed legislation to remove any gray area, gray area and essentially there's, it says that the students have that right uh, to privacy. Now based on the legal advice that we've received so far, um, you know the same may apply here but we don't have legislation so what we're advising is that districts pursue uh, legal advice through their trustee uh, or a trustee because the BCSDA has legal counsel they can turn to. But there are a variety of issues there. There's, um, you know, that child's freedom uh, or, or right to privacy. 
uh, could very well override the parent's right to know as well. Um, there's some issues about a mature student because as an elementary school principal, I was looked at the age of 12 as that kind of age of consent or a mature student because that's when they could determine whether they wanted to see a counselor without the parent's consent. However, it may be younger than that when we talk about a mature minor, it could be eight to 10. Um, so there's some gray area and we have actually worked with the Ministry of Education as well as our partner groups to try to clear that up. So we're hoping that we can have some information go out to all administrators and professionals within education just to, to bring clarity to it. In the end, we may have to follow suit um, in Alberta and, and have legislation that eliminates some of the gray area. Right, great. I, I think that's what a clarity would be very helpful for principals and vice principals and yeah. teachers. And, and just a comment, Matt, um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, um, before we show the video, uh, you know, I think for those of us who've worked in the school system mm -hmm. for a while, at the the, mod, the SOGI model has been very impressive in terms of um, how quickly uh, this has been able to gain traction around the province. Um, maybe if you can just speak a little bit to that point. Yeah, and, and uh, I would agree, actually. I mean, I'm kind of biased. I've been involved almost from the get-go because it started with some informal conversations with a few people who are educators and then built out into this network. But I think there's a confluence of factors there. We had the BCTF who'd been doing this work, a lot of the lead work, leg work, and had really been blazing a trail that we could follow along with many other educators. Uh, we basically are you know, serving as a curator for a lot of the resources that have been established. Um, we also had the Minister of Education who was very supportive and had a personal uh, attachment to this, um, this topic uh, and wanted to see positive change. And so we saw that in uh, the directive to all um, districts to include SOGI into the code of conduct, as well as working towards the change in the human rights code and then funding various SOGI initiatives over the last year and a half, including this position. Uh, but what we found a, a little uh, snapshot in Delta uh, three years ago when we, we thought we'd send out a request for school leads or school contacts, it was in November and we thought, oh, it's a bit late in the fall to do this because most people have already tied themselves down to being a, a contact or a rep. We sent it out anyway, the request, and we, we weren't sure if we'd get more than 50% of schools responding. Well, we had 100% of schools responding with two to five from every school. And I think what it suggests is that maybe we're a little out of step with um, what people wanted to do, the level of passion that's, that's out there, and the fact that I think this work is long overdue and people are trying to catch up. So we've been so impressed. I think we have a, a network now of almost 1,300 volunteers at, in 51 districts, and we're gonna be expanding to work in independent schools as well. We've already had some interest there. Uh, I think there's just, people know that these students and staff members have been working in schools um, for so many years and really been underserved. Right, I think it's a, it was an interesting uh, convergence of sort of the opportunity, sort of addressing the, the need that was in the province for this yeah, type, yeah. these types of supports. So uh, Matt, I think we will, uh, we're coming to the end of our presentation. So if you'd like to close with a video and then um, I've got my eye on the question box. So if there's a quest, one more question that comes up, um, maybe we'll take that following the video. Great, so this video is quite short. It was sent to me from a parent because we show these inspirational videos at my assemblies and I do that and then I'll, I'll send the video home along with some other highlights. And so parents sent me this video because they knew in an upcoming month we were gonna talk about diversity. And I thought, oh, this is a great video. It's pretty LGBTQ heavy. So I was a bit nervous in terms of how the students would respond. If you're looking for a video to introduce this whole notion of SOGI education, how it applies to that general concept of diversity, I think this would be a great video.
heart My doesn't, heart see, doesn't race. see race. Love has no age limit. We are neighbors and best friends. We all have different religions, but we have universal love as well. <laughs> I love my sister. Love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. So I, you see how it ties in with that greater notion of diversity. I shared at the assembly, I was a bit nervous. I stood at the back of the, uh, the gym monitoring those grade sevens and the reveal was very quick at the beginning when the two women come out from behind the screen and kiss. And I thought that's the reaction I'm gonna, uh, well, find out. And there was really silence except for one girl who said, oh, it's two ladies, there was a little giggle. And then at the end of the video, which had not happened uh, at any point after one of these inspirational videos, it was this thunderous applause. As I reflect on that moment, I figure there's another opportunity or, or time where I was uh, a little out of sync with how the kids were uh, dealing with this or their, their thoughts on it. Uh, but I also think that even though not everyone's represented, we don't have a transgender person or someone uh, First Nations, um, I think a lot of people felt represented by that video, maybe for the first time of all the videos that I've shared. So, so on that note, I will turn it over to Kevin and thank you all once again for setting aside some time today uh, to join us this morning. Uh, thank you very much for everyone's participation again. Thank you, Matt, for uh, your presentation. We look forward to next week and have a great day, everyone.